If one measured the influence of a mathematician by the number of mathematical ideas that bear his or her name, then I think John Tate would be a clear winner. We've already heard in the citation so many numerous mathematical concepts that bear John Tate's name. Indeed, mathematicians have even coined a new concept, the Tate Index, defined as the time it takes to give a talk on number theory before you mention the name of John Tate. And in general, this is a very small number. But it's the new insights that these ideas provide into some of the oldest problems of mathematics for which Tate receives the Arbel Prize for 2010. For Tate's ideas have allowed us to understand the secrets of the very numbers from which mathematics is built. Even Tate's PhD was so influential that Tate's thesis has become a byword for the techniques that he introduced that revolutionized modern number theory. His thesis helped us to understand a slightly curious equation. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way up to infinity equals minus 1 twelfth. Now, most people would say if this equation is at the heart of the award of this year's Arbel Prize, surely mathematicians have finally lost it. The famous Indian mathematician wrote to several English mathematicians about his own discovery of this rather strange formula and fully recognized its apparent absurdity as he wrote in the accompanying letter, if I tell you this, you will at once point me out to the lunatic asylum as my goal. But G.H. Hardy, a Cambridge mathematician who got this letter, realized that this calculation was not nonsense at all. In fact, it represents one of the most startling breakthroughs made by one of the greats of mathematics, Bernhard Riemann. And Tate's thesis provided a new mathematical perspective on this equation and Riemann's work that vastly generalized Riemann's achievement and gave it the context that has allowed mathematicians to extend his ideas to many other areas of number theory. At its heart, what these ideas are trying to understand are some of the seemingly most simple, yet most enigmatic and important numbers in mathematics, the prime numbers. These are the indivisible numbers, numbers like 2, 3, 5, 7, and 11. And they're the most important numbers of mathematics because they build all other numbers. Now, if I take a number like 105, clearly it's not a prime number, it's divisible by 5. I get down to 21 times 5. 21 still isn't prime, I can divide that into 3 times 7 times 5. But now I've got down to the indivisible numbers, the numbers that built this number 105. So these prime numbers, 3, 5, and 7, are a little like the hydrogen and oxygen of the world of mathematics. Now, I'm a great believer that mathematics is not a spectator sport and that it's important that you do some mathematics too. So I have a little challenge for you here during my presentation to try and find the numbers which built this number. This is not a prime number, 126,619. It's built out of two smaller numbers. So it's a little bit like salt. And the challenge for you is to find the sodium and chlorine which made up this number. Now, I can't offer you an Arbel Prize for finding these numbers, nor a million dollars, but I will offer some incentive. Um, I have a bottle of champagne to give to anybody um, who can discover the two numbers which built this large number, 126,619. And towards the end of the talk, I'll explain why it's not just champagne that you can win if you can answer this sort of problem. So the primes are the atoms of arithmetic. They're a little bit like the periodic table. So in chemistry, the periodic table it's probably the most important object in their subject. It helps tell us the things from which all molecules are built. So for us, the primes are our own periodic table. But we're still having great trouble trying to understand this sequence of numbers. The ancient Greeks proved 2,000 years ago that they go on forever. So gone is the chance to write them down in some table like the periodic table. Instead, we must try and find patterns to understand this sequence of numbers. And it goes to the heart of what mathematics is all about. A mathematician like John Tate is a pattern searcher, trying to uncover the logic behind this sequence of numbers. But this sequence of numbers is one of the most challenging on the mathematical books, because it doesn't seem to have any patterns at all. But what makes a great mathematician like John Tate or Bernhard Riemann is to be able to look at an old problem in a new way. And Riemann introduced an idea, something called a zeta function, which helps understand the secrets of these numbers. And this idea of a zeta function is central to many of the things that John Tate has contributed to. 
So a function is a little bit like a computer program or a piece of machinery that you feed in a number, it calculates away, and outputs another number. The importance of the zeta function is that this formula is built out of prime numbers. And it's felt that, Riemann felt that if the primes are somehow building this formula, maybe the outputs of this function can tell us something about the secrets of the primes. Now actually what you do is to feed in two numbers into this little program. So those two, or two numbers can be thought of a little bit like the coordinates on a map. And the output of this number is a third number, which is a little bit like the height of a landscape. And so you can draw a picture, a graph, which is a three-dimensional graph, a sort of landscape describing this function. And what Riemann realized is that the contours of this function hold the secrets to the primes. But unfortunately, this formula doesn't always make sense. It makes sense out towards the east, but when Riemann tried to understand the formula out to the west, he was faced with trying to make sense of formulas like the one we started with. 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way to infinity should be infinity. The landscape shouldn't exist. But Riemann developed ideas to help extend the landscape out towards the west, and it's when he discovered the landscape out towards the west that he discovered the secret, the DNA, which holds the secret to the primes which are the points at sea level in this landscape. Now, Riemann's ideas were slightly unnatural, and what Tate's thesis did was to give some clarity to the way that you extend these landscapes in such a way that we can now use his ideas to create landscapes understanding many more different arithmetic structures, not just the prime numbers. And it's in fact trying to solve another mathematical problem about numbers, which Tate has used these sort of landscapes to understand some very deep problems in our subject. In particular, trying to find the solutions to certain equations called elliptic curves. Now, ever since we've been playing with numbers, we've been trying to explore, explore relationships between these numbers. For example, if I take the numbers 3, 4, and 5, then there's a nice relationship which binds these numbers together. If I take the square of the first two and add those together, I get the square of the third number. So this is actually a solution, these three numbers, to a very famous equation, which we all learn at school, Pythagoras' equation, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, which gives you the relationships between three sides of a right-angled triangle. Now, trying to discover solutions to these equations was very important for the ancients. The Egyptians used the solution of 3, 4, 5 in order to help them build the pyramids, because if you take a rope and tie knots to create lengths of three, four, and five, then that rope can be used to guarantee you a right-angled triangle. Very important if you're trying to build the pyramids. Even today, uh, this is a picture I took on my visit to Cairo to, to see the pyramids, they're still using the same rope and the idea of that solution of Pythagoras' equation in order to guarantee a, rectangle, uh, a right angle. Three, four, five is a set of whole numbers which has this relationship, but are there any more? Well, there was another ancient culture, the Babylonians, who found some more solutions. In a very famous tablet, Plimpton 322 at Yale University, there are 15 more sets of numbers which have this beautiful relationship that they're squares. Um, to the square of the first two is the square of the third. Here is a, an example with five digits recorded um, in Plimpton 322. And it was the ancient Greeks who realized, in fact, there are infinitely many solutions to this equation in whole numbers. And they produced an analytic, systematic way to find all of these solutions. Given the success of Pythagoras' theorem, mathematicians moved to more other sorts of equations, trying to find systematic ways to find all of the whole numbers which satisfy these relationships. Archimedes, for example, challenged mathematicians in Alexandria with a very strange set of equations which counted the cattle of the sun. So these equations combined together the number of different cattle of different colors. So you had cattle, black cattle, white cattle, yellow cattle, dappled cattle. And these equations were relationships between the number of cows. And Archimedes wrote to the mathematicians of Alexandria, challenging them to find the number of cows which satisfy these equations. And he concluded, if thou hast computed these also, O friend, and found the total number of cattle, then exult as a conqueror, for thou hast proved thyself most skilled in numbers. Unfortunately, the Alexandrians did not manage to conquer this equation. And it isn't surprising with hindsight, because the number of cows 
that satisfy this equation is a number with over 200,000 digits. It only takes a number with 80 digits to count all the atoms in the observable universe. So a heck of a lot of cows. And at its heart is another equation which we've been interested in solving, um, an equation again with squares. In order to find the solution, you have to solve an equation of this sort of shape, x squared minus 2y squared equals 1. These give you, if you find these solutions, actually nice ways of approximating things like the square root of 2. Now, we have indeed found systematic ways to find solutions to these equations. But John Tate's work is trying to find solutions and a systematic way to find solutions to a slight variant of these equations. Instead of squaring x and y, I'm now going to cube one of those variables. So if I take y squared and I try and make it into the cube of something in x, then we get to these special equations called elliptic curves. And trying to find solutions to these equations turns out to be incredibly difficult. It's one of the deepest problems in the whole of mathematics. If you try and draw a picture of these equations, if you put in values for x and y and see which uh, um, a sort of graph of these equations, you get something which we call a torus or a bagel or a donut. But the challenge is which of these coordinates on this torus are places where both x and y are whole numbers or just fractions. Well, let's take an example. Let's take the equation y squared equals x cubed minus 2. Can you find any numbers, y and x, which bind together to satisfy this equation? Well, if you take x equals 3 and cube it, you get 27. Take 2 away from that, and you get 25, which is a square number, so we can set y equals 5. So we've managed to find two pairs of numbers which bind together by this uh, equation. But are there any more? Mathematicians discovered, in fact, for this equation, there are infinitely many values of x and y where there are both whole numbers or fractions which satisfy this equation. But change the equation very slightly and take a different cubic equation in x. Now we find there are only finitely many solutions. Actually, only seven numbers will satisfy this relationship. And one of the biggest challenges in mathematics is trying to find out how can you tell, given one of these seemingly simple-looking equations, whether there are finitely many or infinitely many solutions. And Tate has been responsible for creating sophisticated machinery that help us to investigate the mysteries of these elliptic curves. And again, he has created a landscape and help us understand a landscape who we think hold the secrets to whether these equations have infinitely many or finitely many solutions. They're like the zeta function that Riemann introduced. It's called an L function. And we believe, and it's one of our deepest conjectures in mathematics, something called the birch swinnerton dyer conjecture, that there's one place in this landscape whose height will tell us whether the elliptic curve which built that landscape has infinitely many or finitely many solutions. But actually, that point is in a region which we weren't able to reach for many years. We didn't know that that bit of the landscape existed. In fact, Tate once said that this remarkable conjecture relates the behavior of an L function at a point where it is not present known to be defined to the order of a group, the tate shafarevich group, which is not even known to be finite. But thanks to Tate's techniques in his thesis and beyond, we can now extend the landscape and reach the point which we believe holds the treasure to understanding these elliptic equations. Now, you might say, who cares? Mathematicians like John Tate study numbers just for the love of them. But there are now very serious practical implications for why knowledge about prime numbers and these elliptic curves could be very significant to the economy. Because prime numbers and these elliptic curves are now the keys to the codes that keep all the secrets secure that travel across the internet. Now, I set you this challenge to break 126,619 into two prime numbers. And I offered you a bottle of champagne as a reward. So has anybody managed to? To find my two primes? Or do I get to go and celebrate with my bottle the award of the Arbel Prize for 2010? Well, if you had found that 127 times 997, in fact, divides this number into primes, you will have, in fact, cracked an internet code. Because it's this sort of problem, trying to find the primes which build numbers, which are at the heart of the codes which protect the secrets on the internet. But internet sites are using slightly larger numbers than this six-digit number. So if you found that uh, too easy a challenge you weren't even going to try, try this 200-digit number. And that's the sort of problem you have to answer to in order to try and crack a code. And the tools that Tate and others introduced to understand prime numbers and elliptic curves ultimately may have very serious real-world applications in helping to show how to crack these codes. 
For thousands of years, we've been wrestling with questions about numbers that are as old as mathematics itself. The numbers one, two, three are the simplest yet most intractable concepts of mathematics. But just as the telescope allowed astronomers to see new worlds, Tate's mathematics has provided tools and insights that have allowed the mathematicians of this generation to see further into the universe of numbers than ever before. John Tate truly deserves to be called the Galileo of number theory. Thank you.